Pastor Conrad Tillett, it's so good to be out here in uh, Bedford Stuyvesant here on uh, Fulton Street and Stuyvesant Avenue in the newly drawn 25th Senate District where you'll be uh, running to represent this particular newly drawn district. Tell me about the district and tell me what you plan to bring to it. Well, thank you very much, Kevin, for this opportunity to talk to your um, audience. Um, I'm always happy to uh, talk to community people, people who have been involved in the community and bring value to the community. Uh, as you said, the 25th Senate District uh, is now a reconfigured 25th. Uh, the old 25th was represented for so many years so ably by uh, Senator Bell Manette Montgomery. But uh, because of redistricting, uh, the district, which used to extend to uh, Red Hook, uh, used to cover Gowanus, used to cover uh, uh, Park Slope, Borum Hill, Fort Greene, and, and Bed-Stuy. Now the district starts at the Fort Greene project. It comes through uh, Clinton Hill, uh, all of Bed-Stuy, and it goes into a significant portion of Brownsville. And so we're very, very happy. Uh, it's a very diverse district. It's almost 400,000 people in the district. It's a large catchment area. Uh, and the district really needs someone who can talk to the folks down in Fort Greene, who can communicate with and understand people uh, across the socioeconomic, uh, cultural, racial lines, um, someone who can empathize with seniors, someone who can identify with youth and young people, someone who can uh, help uh, inspire a community. And that's why I'm running. Uh, I've been a pastor in this community uh, for many years. Uh, I've lived in the district a combined uh, number of about 25 years. Uh, and um, it's, 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 it's a proper time uh, for leadership. You know, we just lost the late great Al Van who lived just a few blocks away from here. That's right. Uh, I lived uh, one block away from him. And when you think about the great Al Van, when you think about the legacy of G2 Weusi and Sonny Carson, uh, when you think about the contributions of Belmanette Montgomery and Annette Robinson, and you think, of course, about the late, great Shirley Chisholm, uh, this is a great community. And we need a continuity of leadership. We need people who understand from whence we've come. We need people who understand the struggle that it took place that took place in Central Brooklyn, uh, in Ocean Hill, Brownsville, uh, in Bedford Stuyvesant, in downtown Brooklyn, and we need to have someone who understands the legacy of Gardner Calvin Taylor, uh, understands the legacy of William Augustus Jones and the boycotts for dignity, uh, and uh, Sandy Ray, and the list goes on and on. And so, as a pastor, as an educator as someone who raised his family in this community, I think I'm the perfect person to represent uh, the diversity of this district. You know, some people uh, raise their eyebrows when they see pastors mm -hmm. run for public office. Uh, my personal opinion about it, my very first congressman uh, was Pastor Adam Clayton Powell. Uh, also, in this election cycle, another iconic uh, pastor, Pastor Warnock, is, is running uh, for his, uh, his, his now held Senate seat for re-election in Georgia. Talk about pastoring and being a public servant sure. at the same time. Yeah, you know, Al Bam was an educator. He was a teacher. Uh, Adam Clayton Powell was a pastor. Warnock is a pastor. One of the great things about our system is that there's no uh, particular credential or qualification you have. Uh, the framers of the Constitution just wanted citizens to represent the citizens. And so we've had farmers uh, go to Congress. We've had people from Wall Street. We've had attorneys. And uh, I think when you look overall at the history of the African-American community and American history, ministers have made a great contribution. Now, of course, I'm not going uh, to Albany to to preach. <laughs> I'm not going to Albany uh, to pastor as such. Uh, I'm going uh, to 
minister to, to serve uh, the entirety of the, of the district. And that will be people who are Muslim. And that will be people who are Catholics. And I'm a Protestant. That will be people who are uh, uh, Hindus. That will be people who have no faith at all. People who have difference of opinions and different ways of living. But if you're a citizen of the 25th, it's my job as the senator to fight for you and to make sure that everything that's guaranteed to all the citizens civilly is guaranteed to you. And I'm very clear on that. Uh, and I think that my educational background, my life experience qualifies me uh, as well as anyone else to step forth and, uh, and, and lead. So I'm, I, I hope people don't think much of that. Uh, I hope they don't because actually Adam Clayton Powell was one of the greatest legislators uh, that America's ever seen. And, if you got a Pell Grant, Adam Clayton Powell's responsible right. for that. That's right. So many other things. And so I hope that people will not get caught up in those kinds of things, but rather they look at the years of experience. You know, I first came uh, to the leadership in, uh, as, a, as a student in Reverend Jesse Jackson's first campaign in 1984. I was only uh, 19 years old. And from 19 to 57, uh, I have provided leadership and in being, uh, been engaged in leadership. So I think, and I'm still young. So I think that is a, a strong battery of credentials to bring to the table. I have to ask you, uh, Pastor Tillett, and tell me if you subscribe to this notion that uh, when it comes to politics, as the kids say, Pastor Tillett's politics hit different. And if that, uh, if you find that statement to be true, please tell me how that manifests itself. Well, I think my politics hit exactly how we need it to hit New York now. Uh, I am a theological moderate. I am a political moderate. Uh, life has shown me that, you know, moderation is very important. You have to have common sense. You have to realize that other people have different views. Other people have different experiences. Uh, and so you got to be able to work with people, uh, to talk to people. That's what a legislator has to do. As a senator, you know, it's not like running for mayor or governor. You're not a chief executive. And so you have to work collaboratively with other people. You have to work collaboratively with other senators from different districts in the city. And the city is, of course, diverse. But you've got to also work with different senators from the state, and the state is extraordinarily diverse. And so I think what we need now, rather than ideologues and people who are just figuring life out, or uh, the angry young man, per se, uh, what we need now are, are people who um, are common sense and, and moderate uh, in terms of going to Albany to get things done. Because, you know, I remember not too long ago, Kevin, we had a Republican governor, a Republican mayor, and Republicans controlled the Senate and the yes. legislature. Yes. And so while the Democrats have this moment, we've got to get things done. The people don't elect us to grandstand. The people are electing Democratic leadership to get things done. And Mayor Adams, my friend of over 30 years, great mayor, he was elected with a mandate to get rid of the crime and fix this city. Well, he can't do that without partners in the legislature. And that's why I want to go so that we can put some common sense back in Albany. I want you to uh, touch on uh, three subjects. Sure. Housing in New York City. Right. Homelessness. Yes. And issues around our senior citizens. Yes. Well, first of all, one of the greatest crises, one of the greatest issues we face in New York City now is housing. The average apartment in Manhattan, the median price for an apartment in Manhattan is up to around $4,000. And that's clearly unsustainable. One of the problems we have is that we're not building enough housing. Uh, my opponent uh, is uh, diametrically opposed to building new housing. Uh, he somehow believes that the solution to housing is to take private homeowners and tax them with onerous uh, legislation that will basically cause them to lose their homes. Uh, small property owners. That's not the solution to the housing problem. 
We need to build more housing. It's very simple. It's a basic lesson of economics. Wherever there's scarcity, the price goes up. When there's plenty, when there's a plethora of housing, the price, naturally, the market takes the price down. And so we need to build more housing. We need to work with responsible developers. And we need to hold unscrupulous developers accountable. Third party transfers, we got to get rid of it. Deed theft, we got to be yeah. hard on people that are moving through this community in unscrupulous and illegal ways and schemes trying to take people housing. But when it comes to ethical uh, developers that, yes, they want to make money, but they also can be given incentives to create more housing, affordable housing for the working class people. You know, New York is a city of bankers. New York is a city of Wall Street. But let's face it, let's not forget, it's a city of actors. It's a city of artists. It's a city of school teachers, of police officers, firefighters. It's a city of clergy persons, city of transit workers and civil servants. And so we've got to make sure housing is affordable. And uh, uh, there's n simply no way to do that without building new housing. And also to create a clear contrast between my opponent and myself, you know, I am a person that believes in public safety. Um, I have children that have grown up in this neighborhood and walk from our home to this subway. Um, I have a 13-year-old that does that every day. Um, we have seniors, my neighbors, people that I know every day. And we need to be concerned about public safety. My opponents made a big deal about letting people out of prison. It's made a big deal about abolish the police and made a big deal about uh, defund the police. And that's fine for an activist, but a senator has to have a basic understanding that public safety is essential to having a safe environment. A community can't thrive without public safety. Business owners need to know that they're not gonna end up with their family uh, working in a family business uh, tied, tied up and face down with a, with a pistol in the back of their head. They need to know that. Uh, uh, seniors and young people need to know that they're not going to be the victims of crime. Women need to know that they can walk their children to school and walk home from work. And so I'm unapologetic in saying that we need to make sure that people who commit violent crimes against other citizens are held accountable. And I have no qualm about saying that. I have fought police brutality since the 1980s. I've been involved. Amadou Diallo, Patrick Dorsman, Richard Lutz. I mean, you can go down the list. I've been there. But I never called for defunding the police. I never called for an abolishment of the police. All we in the movement ever wanted was police to do their job fairly. Leave innocent citizens alone hold and, 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 and arrest those committing crimes, respect and serve the public. And we will respect you and allow you to the, the freedom and the room to do your job. And to me, that's a reasonable position. And in fact, since I have worked in the black community all of my adult life as a minister, uh, and I've lived in the black community my whole life, the black community really realizes that we are not over police, but rather under police. We just have to have good police. And that's why I'm glad we have the mayor that we have, because I've been side by side with him, even when he was on the force against police brutality. And I know he will not countenance police brutality, but he will also not countenance lawlessness in the street. And so all the police need to do is do their job properly, according to their training, according to their ethics and according to what's right. And the citizens respect the police. We give them the tools they need to get the job done because when they are effective and when they're doing their job properly, uh, it, it enhances the city. And so I think that's a reasonable position to take and I'm very comfortable with that position. Before we end, Pastor Tiller, is there anything else you would like to add? Sure. Uh, to. Uh, your campaign, sure. to your policy agenda. Sure. Uh, speak on that now. Sure. And uh, I, I just want to finish up with a, with a final question. Sure. Well, first of all, I want to say that uh, education is a very important issue for me. Uh, I am a, 
a parent of uh, four children. And um, we have used in my family uh, public schools, uh, parochial schools, Montessori, and independent. Um, and so I have a great experience with what it means to be a New York City parent seeking a quality education. I'm a two-time PTA president. Uh, and I'm also a teacher, adjunct professor at City College. So I have a very good understanding of, of uh, public education in New York from kindergarten all the way through uh, graduate school. Um, and, you know, it is difficult in New York uh, to find a quality education. In fact, we had a wonderful Montessori school here uh, that was headed by, still have it, headed by an African-American uh, educator by the name of Tracy Mina. It's called Stuyvesant Heights Montessori. Great school. Uh, but everyone can't afford private school. Yeah. And so, you know, it should not be like winning a lottery uh, to get a quality school. And for many neighborhoods in Brooklyn and in the 25th, parents that are highly motivated and want a first-rate education for their children, unfortunately, they can't just send their child to the street school across the street. And so I'm for uh, more choice for parents. And if that means that some parents want to choose charter schools, we, we've got to make sure that we have options. I'm for community-based charter schools. We have an excellent charter school right here, right down the street on Lewis Avenue called Ember Charter School. African-American educator, uh, NYU graduate, UVA graduate, built a charter school, lives in the community, built a charter school based on a law firm and is giving young people that exposure. They started in kindergarten. We were involved in the beginning of that. Now they're moving toward their first graduating class. Charter schools are public schools. I have neighbors on both sides of me. And in my, on my block, I have neighbors both that have children and grandchildren in charter schools. And I've asked them one question. I said, do you like your school? And they said yes. And you know what my answer is? If you like it, I'm tickled pink. And as a legislator, it's not my job to have a philosophical, or ideological view against charter schools. It's my job to look at the educational opportunities in my community. And when there's a dearth, when they're limited, we've got to create more opportunities. And that's what I want to do. And so finally, um, I'm, I'm, I'm Conrad Tillard, Reverend Conrad Tillard, uh, and I'm running for the New York State Senate. And I hope people that uh, have known me over the years throughout my uh, many positions and titles uh, and work in this city will get behind my candidacy and on August 23rd will turn out in droves and vote for Conrad Tillard for proven leadership, for consistent leadership, for a community competent leadership, and for leadership that will not let you down. Also. I'm very excited about the opportunity of representing the folks of Brownsville. Brownsville is often forgotten. Uh, it is often neglected. Uh, and I pledge that I will, if upon elected, I'll put an office in Bedford-Stuyvesant and we'll have a satellite office in Brownsville to bring services uh, to, the, to the residents of Brownsville. So I'm excited about this race. I'm supported by Mayor Adams. Uh, I'm supported by many elected officials, Kevin Parker, the first person to endorse me. Um, I'm supported by Yusuf Salam, uh, Shine Barrow, and I'm, those aren't celebrity endorsements. I'm not interested in celebrity endorsements. Those are young men that I met who were from the community in times of crisis, and I ministered to those young men. And uh, with God's help, the love of their parents, and the ministry that I was able to do, those young men have grown to be shining examples of what, of what rehabilitation and what uh, strong character is all about. So when the Honorable Shine Barrow, who was arrested and known as Rapper Shine, endorses me now as the opposition leader, a senator in his home country of Belize, and Yusuf Salam, Dr. Yusuf Salam endorses me, that makes me very proud because that says that for 30 years uh, I have been working on behalf of the community serving before I ever thought about running for office. Segwayed into my final question. Mm -hmm. And uh, although we could have uh, a multi-series mm -hmm. uh, discussion mm -hmm. on religion. Yes. 
I don't want to have a discussion on religion. Mm -hmm. I just want you to give me just a few minutes sure. on the status as we stand here in August 2022. Mm -hmm. I want you to just give me a few minutes on faith. Sure. You know, one of the things I realize is that faith is important in a human being's development. And I realize also that people have different ways of expressing their faith. But I do know this, faith and hope are important. One of the things that disturbs me most, and that's why I'm running, is that I think young people in this country are being given a dim and dismal vision. I'm sorry, but I, I reject that socialist vision because it's a vision that paints a dark picture. And I want young people to realize that this is the best time to be alive in the world. If they had been born during the time of polio, polio could have taken them out. We just came through a global pandemic. And in one year, the business community, the medical community, and the political community came together to create a vaccination. It's a great time to live. We've gone from slave ships to championships. We've gone from the outhouse, as Reverend Jackson said, to the courthouse, to the state house, to the White House. And if Madam C.J. Walker and Jesse Hill, if our great giants, Booker T. Washington and W.E.B. Du Bois and Mary McLeod Bethune and all of these folks in the past could forge a way and make great gains, then I'm saying we've got to be optimistic, hopeful, and have faith. You know, one of the great prayers that Du Bois wrote, uh, uh, and, and even Leon Sullivan, the great minister yes. uh, in Philadelphia. They called him the Lion of Zion. He prayed a prayer that said, yes, we have to have faith in God. And there are many different expressions in our district. We have Hindus, we have Buddhists, we have uh, Muslims, Christians, etc. But he said, you also have to have faith in yourself. And faith and hope spring eternal in the human breast. And I'm so grateful that when I was 18 years old, I heard Reverend Jackson say, keep hope alive, up with hope and down with dope. And uh, that has sustained me many years through a lot of challenges in my life. But I realize that if a person has faith in something bigger than themselves, hope, you can always forge through the storms of life. And that's what I pledge to remind the folks in the 25th, that there's always a sunny side of life. And we've got to look for that optimism and hope and forge through. Pastor Tiller, thank you so very much for your time. It's been such a privilege, privilege standing out here in Bevis Davison with you and hearing your views on many, many, many topics. And again, brother, I want to say thank you so very much. I'm grateful and I thank you so much standing in front of the great Pride and joy of Bed-Stuy Boys and Girls High School, where I served on the Community Advisory Board with the great, late, great Al Van. It's just a privilege to be here. Vote Conrad Tillard on August 23rd. Thank you. Thank you so very much.